Hello everyone, this is lesson uh, 25, lecture 3, uh, in which we are going to conclude our discussion of the transformation from Octavian to Augustus. Um, so, um, to continue uh, uh, this discussion, uh, where we want to, want to start is uh, uh, the last slide, Revenge for Caesar's Murder. Um, so we talked a little bit about here, the overstatement implied that uh, um, Octavian was the only one responsible for taking revenge uh, for uh, Caesar's um, uh, murder, because we know Antony was also a part of that. In fact, he was the one so successful in the battles against Brutus and Cassius. But I think that uh, um, it's so important for Augustus to take revenge uh, 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 for his father that in fact, this will become a key part of his message and self-representation. And I think that um, um, it's very helpful for my students usually to think of Augustus as neither a man of war or man of peace, but instead as a man of war and peace. So the revenge uh, for uh, his father uh, is just one part of a much larger message uh, that Augustus is able to uh, deliver. But just to understand how key this sort of uh, role is, the connection with the father, uh, Ben Augustus later in his life will build a forum about which much more is uh, uh, going to come in future lectures. Uh, the temple on it, which you recall on the Forum of Caesar was a temple to Venus. Uh, on uh, the Forum of Augustus, it's going to be a temple to Mars and not just any Mars, who is the god of war anyways, but Mars the Avenger. So that's gonna be a huge part of his uh, uh, identity that he was able to accomplish this, right? And that, that uh, sort of it, what the threat that it implies, namely you mess with me, that's what you're going to encounter. Again, we see actions and, and representations of, of his uh, power. Further on, uh, due to that arrangement that we have seen uh, uh, in uh, the earlier part of the lecture, that he had proconsular authority over a number of provinces, uh, Augustus was personally responsible for the majority of the Roman army. So the way uh, uh, that looks is that uh, the emperor had control over a number of key provinces, such as Africa, Asia, those are the two wealthiest uh, uh, provinces, uh, and uh, together with Sicily, those are also very important sources of grain in Rome. And uh, uh, through these uh, pink uh, provinces here, he is able to essentially also make the claim that any protection that the Roman Empire needs is going to now be in his own uh, uh, hands. Uh, uh, similarly, there are a few uh, uh, sort of senatorial provinces, but those are never the ones uh, that are currently in conflict. And any uh, uh, sort of conflict area, so for example, he will have wars in Germany and some, some wars in the uh, uh, east or in, in modern day Turkey. Um, those, uh, all those wars, essentially, he will be able to say, I was responsible for the protection of the Roman people. So the suggestion is that he will defeat all enemies, whoever might think of, um, uh, think of attacking uh, the Roman Empire. And, but at the end, that he's doing all this fighting to bring peace to the Roman people. So we can see this sort of war and peace uh, type of theme uh, happening. And uh, the last um, bit of this message that's really interesting is that by pacifying the provinces, because we know that the exact same territory was also, of course, the site of civil war in the early years of Octavian's life. You recall that uh, fighting in, in Sicily, in, in Greece, in, in uh, Egypt. So uh, the suggestion is also that by pacifying uh, the provinces, he in fact somehow earned that these provinces should be loyal to him and he is now providing peace for them, right? So, so there is this sort of mutual uh, relationship between Augustus and all the provinces, not just the ones with the majority of the Roman army, but indeed all of them. And I think sometimes uh, my students find it sort of interesting how Augustus uh, uh, so strongly develops uh, this representation of himself as uh, a military figure. And, it's a key image, and if you look on this slide, 
This is called the Prima Porta depiction of Augustus. Prima Porta mainly getting its name from the site where the statue was recovered uh, in, uh, in ancient uh, uh, Rome. Uh, but this is a statue that represents Augustus as a key military commander. He is uh, uh, dressed uh, uh, to fight. He is dressed as a, a general. And uh, on the uh, cuirass, the chest plate that he bears, uh, on that uh, uh, statue. In fact, what we see is the Romans reclaiming some military signs that they lost at the time when Parthia, in Parthia, Crassus was uh, uh, defeated. So the idea is, you know, uh, even a sense of conquest uh, beyond just what is Rome, sort of essentially uh, the sense that the the whole world is now under the control of Augustus. And so such military representations abounded in, in Rome, in addition to Augustus's Prima Porta statue that you see here, uh, even though they don't survive today, we are uh, certain and we have representations of on coins that he also had triumphal arches uh, uh, set up as it is represented on this coin, for example. So a triumphal arch, right? So essentially the main part of this uh, is just a big gate under which you can uh, sort of go through, uh, was a key way in which Roman emperors, uh, later on everywhere in the empire, was able to um, use this language of victory uh, because putting these in key places, so the thoroughfares, uh, essentially they forced everybody to go under them. And uh, on the top, you often find very significant representation. In this case, we see Augustus on, uh, uh, a chariot uh, representing him as a sort of victorious figure, potentially even like uh, uh, a god. And uh, one of the uh, uh, questions that sometimes comes up in these discussions is sort of what kind of wars uh, Augustus in fact uh, fought. And I don't want you to get too uh, sort of anxious about memorizing all the wars listed on this uh, uh, slide. Uh, but one thing I uh, would like you to uh, notice is that increasingly uh, uh, we see, for example, in 28, uh, there is a Cornelius Gallus who fights on his side, uh, which will be counted as um, his victory. Here we see another guy, Aelius Gallus, uh, another person, Petronius, his right-hand man Agrippa fights in the east, uh, and um, in, uh, there is Lucius Cornelius Balbus in Africa, um, and later on, uh, uh, even his um, uh, steps on Tiberius uh, uh, fights uh, in uh, uh, the Balkans, Drusus, uh, Gaius Caesar, other family members, in fact, often fight for him in his later years, and then other military commander, uh, famously uh, suffers a defeat uh, in 9 CE uh, that Augustus was quite um, uh, upset about. And um, one thing that's interesting about that particular uh, uh, loss in 9 CE is that this is uh, a period, here we are in sort of uh, Northern uh, uh, Europe, this would be sort of the modern day Netherlands and then uh, Germany. And uh, we are absolutely certain that um, uh, Augustus was trying to expand uh, against these German uh, tribes uh, across uh, uh, the Rhine. However, uh, this was not successful, and uh, this commander Varus uh, lost three legions when they were surrounded by uh, uh, the Germans and uh, essentially were slaughtered. And rather famously, Augustus was so upset about this that he used to walk around in his house and saying, Varus, Varus, what did you do with my legions? And I think that uh, when he says my allegiance, that starts to give us, give us a little bit of a sense of how much he considered all of this warfare, no matter who was fighting in the actual war, even if it was not him personally, as a sort of extension of his own capacity to fight wars. In fact, in a key change from the early Republic, any victory under Augustus uh, uh, now earned a triumph for him. So even if it was someone else who was successful in a military victory, there was a different commander that he sent out. In Rome, the triumphal chariot had Augustus on it and it was him uh, who got the uh, reward. There was an exception made for family members who could also get triumph, but no more Roman 
members of the elite senators, consuls get any more trials uh, uh, soon after Augustus becomes uh, Augustus. So we see this sort of monopolization of military victory, which is part of, again, this larger sense that all of this empire is now in his hand, that he's directly controlling and he is responsible for victories. And it's his uh, claim to power that is always at stake. And in a further extension of this um, idea, in fact, in uh, this period by his right hand man, uh, uh, Agrippa, uh, there was a large world map displayed in the city of Rome, suggesting this claim that Rome now had to control the whole world. Now, when you look at this tentative reconstruction of the map, we do not have the original. Uh, you might notice that it's not exactly a good map of the world, but nevertheless, it's a fascinating uh, uh, depiction and the whole idea is fascinating, uh, suggesting to us that the Romans all of a sudden started to really think of themselves as not just sort of the city of Rome, but really the people, uh, by example, who are going to control all all of this uh, uh, world. Um, it's also a beautiful representation of how, you know, Rome is on the sea and the sea is so uh, central to this uh, uh, expansion. Um, so this world map being displayed in Rome further sort of supported Augustus's claim that under his direction, the Romans were now able to uh, control the whole world. And it was him uh, as a man of war and man of peace who was ultimately responsible for all of this. So in sum, uh, for uh, this lesson now, we can uh, go back to uh, Mary Beard and uh, see her summary of the res gestae and Augustine self-representation uh, and see how much that was part of what contributed to his success. So this is how he sum she summarizes what was in the res gestae, what was uh, on his deeds about. It also amounts to a clear blueprint for one man rule. Augustus's power, as he formulates it, is signaled by military conquest, we just saw it, so this, by his role of protector and benefactor of the people in Rome, and by construction and reconstruction on a vast scale, and it was underpinned by massive reserves of cash combined with the display of respect for the ancient traditions of Rome. It was against this blueprint that every emperor for the next 200 years was judged. So to me, this is ultimately the reason, or a very good reason, to consider Augustus the first emperor of Rome, is that he is the one who is able to establish a system that becomes sort of the model system for all of his successors to follow. And it is the one that um, uh, later emperors will be considering as the model that they want to follow. Military victory and military success is a key part of this. And uh, uh, that is why Augustus is a man of war and a man of peace at the same time. Thank you.